Okay. So just to give a small introduction, uh, hello everyone. Uh, we have Bingy Chen again with us. Uh, Bingy was already with us uh, to explore Proto Galaxy, which was uh, one of uh, his papers last year. And he has kindly accepted to, to come back here and talk to us about uh, one of his latest uh, works, which is Paceful. So um, I want to first show uh, appreciation to you and, and, and thank you very much, Vinji, for, for coming up again and, and guiding us through through your new uh, work. The floor is yours. Yeah. So please, yeah. if we could I'm go happy on. to do that. Thank yeah, you're welcome. I'm trying to operations. So I, can, I guess I can get started then. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Bing Yi, and today I'm going to be presenting one, one of my recent works called Baseboard, which is a new polynomial commitment scheme for a multilinear polynomial such that it can support arbitrary fields and is built based on a new uh, primitive called foldable codes, which I will explain later. So the main motivation of this work is to try to construct a much more efficient TK snarks. So I think all the audience should be familiar with TK snarks. It is a powerful primitive that allows some weak device to, uh, to check and verify the expensive computation efficiently. Uh, I think there's a, already a question or should I? Uh, okay. Yeah, so I, I, I just gonna continue. And then if any question, Carlos, please, please ping me on the on the chat so I can answer uh, in time. I'll, I'll definitely do that, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So it is uh, uh, slightly more formally, is a succinct zero knowledge proof showing that there exists some secret witness together with some public input, and then it is satisfiable by some uh, Boolean circuitry. So usually it consists of some pre-processing phase, so given some public parameter and some high level a program or some circuit C, you generate some proving key and verification key. And later the prover after receiving the public inputs and the witness should be able to generate a short proof and verify after getting the proof will output, uh, output a bit indicating whether it accepts or not. So as always, it satisfies se several properties. I think most of people are already familiar with it, so I will get go through it really quickly. So it has to satisfy completeness, meaning that an honest prover, after having this secret witness, can in compute some correct proofs that pass the verification. And not soundness means that no matter what a malicious prover does, if he can uh, like pass the verification with high probability, it must be the case that he actually knows some correct witness. And succinctness means that um, the proof size is should be much, much smaller than the original witness and it should be fast to verify. And general knowledge means that the proof should be um, kind of like hiding the information of the original witness. So we have already seen there are tons of applications of ZK SNARKs in the field of blockchain, as well as other fields like machine learning or some other privacy preserving payment system and so on. And the dream goal or the ultimate goal here for ZK SNARKs is to try to do the proving as fast as computing, okay? So the goal is to try to um, make the speed of generating a proof as fast as the speed of executing a, a program. Uh, meanwhile, we still want to preserve this small proof size and verification cost, even for large statement. However, in the reality, there is still a very huge gap between the proving and pro program execution. So in order to improve it, there are usually two ways to try to improve the state of the art. So the first direction is about front ends. Well, we want to uh, come up with some e efficient transformation from some high level program or circuit statements into some algebraic relation statement that's easy to prove. For example, uh, R1CS constraint system or Planckish constraint system are some examples. So here the goal is to try to convert a statement into as fewer number of constraints as possible. And after having this algebraic relation statements, the second question or the second direction we can improve is to come up with much faster uh, proving algorithm for proving this algebraic relation statements. The ultimate goal will be like the proving time will be linear to the number of constraints you have. So there are, in our work, this will be having impact on both directions. 
So in, there are so many framework for doing SNARKs. And one of the most promising framework for having a really fast prover is the so-called multivariable LP based SNARKs. And in this framework, initially we'll have some circuit statements or high level program uh, statement. And we'll transform into some algebraic relation statements like R1CS, Plonkish, and AIR. And then um, the prover and the verifier will run the, some protocol, so-called poly-LP protocol, to prove that this algebraic relation statement holds true. So in this poly-LP protocol, there will be um, the several runs, and in each run, the prover will send some polynomials uh, to the to the verifier, and the verifier will reply with some challenges. And finally, after all the runs ends, the verifier can carry some event. PCS or polynomial evaluations to the polynomials oracles. And according to the answer, he will out output yes or no. So this kind of uh, uh, poly LP protocol at this point is not succinct yet because in each round, the prover needs to uh, send some really, really large polynomial that is linear to the size of the number of constraints. So it has to be combined with the so-called polynomial commitment scheme that allows you to commit a large polynomial into a short string and later also generates more proofs for proving certain evaluation, like polynomial evaluation statements. And this com combination makes us a uh, SNARK. So initially, this kind of framework was uh, introduced in the setting of a universe setting, where the polynomials are, are universe polynomials. But later, it has been expanded and extended to the multiverse setting as well by Spartan and uh, Hyperplunk. So you may ask why we care about multivariate poly LP here or multivariate SNARKs. Uh, the key reason here is that in the multivariate setting, we have a significantly more efficient poly LP protocol, which is based on the sum check protocol. The key advantage here over univariate poly LP is that it can, the prover only needs to perform a linear number of field, field operations, rather, uh, rather cost a linear number of operations in the univariate poly LP because of the use of FFTs. Moreover, there's no restriction, mostly like um, there's no restriction on the field choice except the field size, uh, so that sound is still host. So indeed, there is a big advantage of using a multivariate poly LP. However, this, this framework, this SNARK framework, doesn't see a very, very significant advantage over the universe SNARKs in practice for now. Why? The reason is that we don't have a significantly more efficient polynomial commitment scheme. So it turns out at, at the current uh, uh, state of the arts, the com complexity of univariate PCS is not that bad compared to uh, multilinear PCS. So there are several options to construct a polynomial commitment scheme in a multilinear setting. The first one is to do this variance uh, of KZG or fully proof. But this type of scheme is not very good on the prover side because it involves some really expensive elliptic curve scalar operations. Okay, so another option is to use the breakdown or Ligero. The, those are Martinini PCS um, built from the so-called tensor-based IOPP, which uh, for IOPP I will explain a little bit later. So this kind of scheme has really, really fast prover, uh, which is great thing. However, um, it ha also has some, some drawback, uh, mainly because it has really expensive proof size and verification time. The complexity is about uh, square root n rather than logarithmic. So given this, there's a third option that is built from the FRI, uh, so-called FRI polynomial low degree testing protocol or FRI RPP protocols. And uh, I will explain a little bit more on how it, uh, how it works, but uh, um, at a high level, it has the following advantages. First, it has no expensive cryptography operations as well. So there's no elliptic curve operations. Um, the only operation is just a field operation and a hash operation, which are all amazingly fast. And second is transparent and plasma post constant secure. And finally, it still preserves polylogarithmic proof size and verification, which is an advantage compared to breakdown. However, it also has its own disadvantages. Um, the first thing is that it requires the use of so-called FFT-friendly field because it inherently needs to run FFTs. FFT friendly means that it has some like a uh, large multiplicative subgroup that is a order of power of two or power of three, for example. 
And we do know that there exists some other work, which is the very elegant work that get rid of these constraints. So you can do FFT even without FFT friendly field. However, this construction is not that concretely efficient. And also in the, in the setting of building a PCS, the symptotic complexity also has some log log logarithmic factor of loss. That's the first disadvantage. The second disadvantage is that in this sprite based Martinian PCS, it actually goes through several compilation step or transformation step from the original fry into the final PCS. For example, you need to transform fry into a univariate PCS first, and then transform univariate PCS into a multivariate PCS. So this compilation has an extra overhead, uh, which makes the PCS less efficient. Hence, our question are the following. Um, first, can we have now a fry like our PP, but doesn't require the FFT friendly field. And this is what we call the field agnosticity. And second is whether we can have a more direct compilation from an IOPP to a Martini PCS that doesn't need to go through these many transformations, which has extra overhead. The answer is of course, yes. And before I presenting our contribution, let me highlight why we really care about this field agnosticity. And this will echo with my um, two direction I mentioned before. So with the flexibility of choosing the field, first we can, in the front end side, we can avoid those non-native field simulation in the circuits. And uh, for example, a typical uh, application will be the ECDSS signature verification circuit in which the curves uh, will use some field that's totally not FFT friendly. So suppose you only can use the algebraic relation statements over a FFT friendly field, then you have to like translate these all these uh, operations over a different field into this uh, FFT friendly field, which is super expensive. You need to do a lot of uh, constraint to just simulate one operations. So with the flexibility of choosing a field, you will, will never have non-native field simulation, and uh, this will be a great saving on transforming a uh, circuit statement into an algebraic relation statement. And the second advantage here is that with field agnosticity, we can use those fields that has the most efficient CPU and hardware implementations. For example, typical example including Mercedes field and Baby Bear field, which are super fast in CPU and hardware, but they are not uh, FFT friendly. Uh, I guess I can, I'll take questions for now. Any questions right now? Okay, cool. Well, so I will come in the chat. So you yeah. can in the yeah. yeah, okay, great. So I can, I'll continue then. Um, so our main contribution is following. So first we generalize this fry LPP and or fry low degree testing protocol that only support resolvent codes <clears throat> into a more general LPP that can work for all the so-called foldable linear code, which we will introduce later. And second, we construct a new foldable code. Like resolvent code is a special case of foldable code, but we construct a new foldable code that can support any field, which resolvement code doesn't uh, quite satisfy. And this any field, this is a, a there's, there's still some minimal requirements on the field, but uh, I think that's minimal and it's not a big deal. And finally, given this uh, generalized LPP, we have a really lightweight uh, compilation into a Martinini PCS, which uh, use some check. And the overhead is minimal on some check side. And on the other hand, if you instantiate this IOPP with some uh, field agnostic foldable codes, then the resulting Martini PCS is also field agnostic. So it's obvious to see that this advan the advantage of this construction is that now it supports almost arbitrary fields, not only FFT friendly field. And second, there's no longer a univariate to multivariate compilation overhead, uh, which is uh, another kind of saving. And this, uh, this saving, the second saving works for arbitrary field. For example, you, even if you use resolvent code, you can still uh, enjoy this kind of uh, advantage. And finally, it preserves other efficiency advantages of the fry LPP. And we also know there are several related work um, um, that's also generalized LPP for other type of codes like polynomial code or algebraic geometry codes. And it will be a very interesting open question to see if we can unify this framework into a one general framework. Okay, the agenda of the talk will be following. Um, first, I'll explain 
how to generalize fry OPP to support a broader class of codes. And second, I will explain how to construct a new foldable code that can work for almost arbitrary field. And finally, I will give an uh, explanation on how to compile this IOPP into a Martinina PCS. Okay, so let's start with the first part. Uh, as I said before, I, I mentioned a lot of times of IOPP, but you may not be familiar with what IOPP is. So to give an, a bit of context, IOPP stands for Interactive Oracle Proofs of Prox Proximity, Proximity. And the goal of it is to try to um, say we have an Oracle string, which can be quite, quite large. And the goal here is to for the prover to convince the verifier that this Oracle string is close to some code word. Okay. For example, in the Ray Solomon code setting or in the Fry setting, the key, uh, the question here will be try to check that this Oracle is close to the, uh, is, is the evaluation uh, of some low degree polynomials. And usually the format of IOPP will be follows. So it involves several rounds of interaction. And in each interaction, or in each round, the prover will send some Oracle, some other Oracle strings, and the verifier will reply with some challenges. And then adaptively, the prover will send some other challenges in the next round, and so on. And finally, the verifier can parry some entry uh, of these oracles and get the answer of these entries. Basically, you just um, get the values of a certain index of these uh, oracles. And after that, the verifier will output uh, yes or no. And we require it to satisfy several property. First, completeness means that if this oracle string pi is indeed a code, code word, and if the prover is honest, then he should always pass the verification. And second, if this pi is far from any code words, then uh, the verifier has to be, uh, no matter what prover does, the verifier will output reject with some hyperbolicity, where this probability is proportional to the distance between pi and, and any code words. So that's why also the minimum relative distance of this code word also plays a role here because that determines the bound of the soundness error. And finally, the complexity is measured by both the computational time of prover and verifier, as well as the number of queries um, made by the verifier. And Fry LPP is just the one particular instantiation uh, that particularly works for Ray Solomon code or, or universal polynomials. So here, the Oracle string would be the evaluations of some polynomial f uh, that's evaluated at the domain L. For example, you can understand L as something like the set of two to the nth roots of unities. And here the goal is to check this Oracle string is a real Solomon code word, meaning that it is, a, it is the evaluations for some low degree polynomial. Like for, the, for example, here the degree should be less than two to the k. An idea of Rio is falling. Well, given this polynomial F, we can decompose it into two parts. So we can collect the coefficients for those even degree monomials into a polynomial Fe x squared here, and collect the coefficient for those odd degree monomials into Fo x squared here. So you can rewrite Fx as Fe x squared plus x times Fo x squared. And then after receiving a random challenge from a very file, the prover will fold this Fe polynomial and Fo of polynomial using this random challenge C1. And then he'll run the resolve encoding and send the encoding or the set of evaluations as a second oracle and send it to the verifier. So why we want to do this? The great feature of this round of communication is that we have reduced the original problem into a similar problem, but with one smaller dimension. Before we want to check an oracle should be close to a code word, uh, like should, uh, should be close to a code word such that the message is a, a, a polynomial of degree less than two to the k. And now it turns out that if prover is honest and it does the folding operation correctly, this new oracle uh, should be a for this new oracle should be an encoding for a polynomial with degree less than two to the k minus one. And here the demand L1 is also half of the demand L. You can understand as uh, the set of two to the n minus one roots of unities. So now we reduce the original problem into one similar problem that has one smaller dimension, and we can do this again and again, right? Basically, and finally, after logarithm runs, we only need to check that this oracle is a constant polynomial, 
for which the verifier can very easily to check. We will check that is constant polynomial. But at this point, I'm missing one thing, um, is that I assume that prover is honest. So he will always do the folding operation of this fex plus c1fo correctly and honestly and send the oracle to the verifier. But that might not be the case uh, if the prover is malicious, he might be able to just send some junk polynomial in the, these intermediate runs, right? So that's why we need another uh, procedure to detect this kind of malicious behavior that's called consistency check, where the verifier will sample some random index on this original big domain L, and from this uh, index U, you derive also other index to be checked on the intermediate oracles. And then we'll check that for each adjacent two oracles in the adjacent two rounds, the oracle are consistent with each other. And how to check the consistency? The mainly we are checking this folding operation are correct with respect to this point, uh, with respect to this entry and the entry in the previous oracle. So we want to check that this f is equal to f e plus uh, c i c c i f o. And uh, the question is, what is exactly f e and f o here? How do you check that? And this will come up back to this uh, decomposition formula we had before. So given this decomposition formula, we know that this value can be interpolated, uh, interpolated given the previous oracle by just doing square roots, okay? So this is the main idea. Uh, any questions so far? I have one. Can, can you elaborate a bit more on, on how and why you are doing this interpolation? The, the, um, from, from the part where you pick this random view, I got mm -hmm. I got lost. So you have been so far trying to see the proximity between a code word, right? Mm -hmm. Between mm -hmm. code words. So now you sample this random view with the goal of what? Trying to with the goal to check, yeah, with, with the goal to check that, for example, let's see the example from the relation between F and F1, right? We want to make sure that the the first oracle is consistent with the original oracle. Yeah. So that means that uh, I want to check that f1 is compute correctly, that definitely f1x should be equal to fex plus c1fox, right? And sure. definitely it should be the case that it, this holds true at a random point, right? Oh, and, I, see. I see, I see, I see, yeah. fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, and now feu and fou can be recovered from the two values from f because there is this the relation between fe and fo and f, which is this uh, fx equals fe x square plus x fo x square. So to get the value of fe uh, x, you only need to get uh, the value of f on square to u and the minus square to u so that you can do this uh, uh, polynomial interpolation to recover the value of fe so that you can check that is consistent with f1 is consistent with f here. So that's the general idea. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, thank you. And there's also another question in the chat, which mm -hmm. is: so you will do this check for each step, or just for a randomly chosen one? Uh, so I will do this check finally. So after run all these uh, runs, the verifier will sample uh, one index, and from this few one index, he'll deterministic derive some other index for other runs and he'll check this consistency for all the runs, for the all organ runs actually together, finally. Yeah. So basically you, you will do have a check for each for each in runs, for each step, but this the, the index you queried are kind of correlated, which is also very important for the security analysis. Yeah, uh, does that answer your question? So basically also, I mean that this U1 is randomly chosen, but all this U2 to UK, which are chosen, which are checked for the other next oracles are not uniformly, are not independently chosen. They are correlated to the original uh, index. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So one of the inherent limitation here is that the, this, this kind of scheme requires that this field to be FFT friendly for two reasons. First reason is that you need to do resolving encoding in each round, which involves uh, some FFT-like algorithm. And second is that we also require this field, uh, this demand L to be quite smooth so that you can quickly go from um, the, the I's demand Li into the I plus one's demand Li plus one using some very simple algebraic operations 
and particularly here it will be just square or do square roots. So these are the two reasons that you really need the FFT friendly field. So the natural questions can we generalize beyond this free Solomon code? And before generalizing it, let me explain an alternative understanding of this free Solomon coding in the Fry case. And that will give you a flavor on how to generalize it. So in the Fry setting, we are basically using a D difference uh, free Solomon coding scheme. Well, the IC encoding is just to, to is an encoding that uh, has message space of you know, very polynomial of degree less than two to the i. And the output space will be the some two to the i plus c evaluations on some demand. Okay. And uh, we 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 can extract some foldable foldability property from this set of Ruiz Solomon code. Basically, in suppose we want to uh, encode a polynomial f of degree to to the k plus one or to the i plus one. Um, what we do is that as we said before, fx can be understood as fe x squared plus x of o x squared. And then the resolving encoding is just the evaluation of this polynomial as the set of roots of unities, okay? Which is omega omega two to omega two to the i plus c. And this is actually can be rewrite written and re understand like understand as follows. Oh, uh, so I'll explain more what it means. So first let me uh, prove that, argue that this is correct, this is indeed correct. So uh, basically the upper left, this blue box here, is actually initially what we want is to be the evaluation of Fe x squared, right? On the demand of omega, omega two, omega three, and two omega two to the i plus c minus one. And then you can rewrite this as the evaluation of Fe x, so we replace x squared with x, but the points becomes the square, right? So basically the points becomes omega square, omega fourth, omega six, and omega two to the i plus c. And you see here, as I said before, the demand of L, Li and L plus i plus one is exactly a square uh, relation. So this, this uh, omega two, omega fourth, and omega two to the i plus c is exactly the demand for the resolving coding of Fe in the ice encoding scheme. So you can trust me that indeed this is correct. So the upper left-hand side is indeed the encoding of Fe on the ice resolving encoding scheme. And similarly, uh, this also holds true for RSI FOX and the right-hand side. So now what you can see is like you can understand this, this code words as two parts, the concatenation of two parts. And the first part is just the, some uh, sm smaller encoding plus some other smaller encoding head map product a some vector here. And this vector is just some powers of roots of unities. And this vector on the left-hand side is slightly different from the right-hand side. Basically it's the left part of the domain L and the right part of the domain L. So it has this kind of property. So the natural question is whether we can generalize this property into a broader class of codes rather than only resolving code. And that comes to our new notion of this foldable linear codes. So similar as before, a foldable linear codes will specify by a list of D encoding scheme and the IC encoding scheme will have for some um, message length two to the I and block length C times two to the I. And it also will specify by this kind of T vectors here, we'll, which, which will explain a, it will spend a little more. So now the foldability can be understand as follows. So basically we want to make sure that there exists some structural relation between the I plus one encoding and I encoding scheme. And in particular, you should like, looks like this, which is very, very familiar with what I said before, right? So basically everything's the same and except that this T vector and TIR vectors in the resolve case, is just those powers of rules of unities. But here it's more general. It allows arbitrary type of T vectors. Like T, the only constraint we have here is just the, that t, for every column J, the TILJ should not equal TIRJ. So why we want to have uh, this kind of uh, description of this property? And there's a very intuitive understanding. So you can understand that the encoding of ML and encoding of MR, they can be understood as some coefficients, the coefficient form of some C times two to the I linear polynomials or degree one polynomials. So here each column will correspond to a polynomial here. Right? Each column calls to some coefficient of ink IML and ink IMR. And also now you see that this encoding 
of ML concatenate MR can be understood as some point evaluation form or interpolated form of this C times two to the I linear polynomials. Okay, so there, there's won't be some uh, information loss here. And for example, consider any column J on the left-hand side is just the evaluation of the J's degree one polynomial at points T I L J. And similarly, the J's column on the right-hand side is just the evaluation at T I R J. So this is some way for you to understand what, how we're actually just doing some interpolation or like a uh, base transformation from coefficient form into uh, evaluation form when you do this foldability. Um, so any questions so far? So after generalizing the class of codes, you may ask the natural question will be how to generalize this ILPP uh, for any for any foldable codes, for, not for only for restoring code. The idea is actually uh, pretty simple. So we can just rerun all this logic and the uh, proving ideas in fry LPP again, but more generally. So recall the goal is to check this string is close to some code words. And here, the particularly our goal is to check is uh, close to some code words in the this encoding scheme of this foldable code. And then what we do is very similar to before. What we do is we split this message into two parts, ML and MR. And then we encode ML and MR to get EL and ER respectively. And, and also recall that we have this structure probability, uh, struct property about the fallibility before, so that there is this relation between pi L, pi R, and this EL and ER. And after receiving the challenge from Verifile, what we do is very, very simple. We just fold these two encodings of ML and MR respectively. So just, it will be just EL times C1 times ER. And by the linearity of the code, you see that this new oracle will be just the encoding of the a folded message, which is ML plus C1 MR, okay? And suppose prover is honest and suppose pi is indeed the code words in CD, then you can see this is indeed a code word in CD minus one as well. So we can do something similar before by the reduction, we reduce some problem into a very similar problem, but with one smaller dimension. So it's almost the same as before in fry LPP. And similarly, we also need to do this consistency check as we mentioned before to detect malicious behavior from prover. And here the check is also very, very similar. Well, we also sample uh, random index in L and, get, and check the consistency between the first Oracle Pi one and the original Oracle Pi, which is, uh, which is basically we want to check that this folding operation is correct. Basically pi one u equals el u plus c one eru at this random point u. Well, and e, because of this foldability property, el and er are actually be able to uh, extract it or interpolate it given the previous oracle pi. So that's the general idea uh, and it's actually pretty simple and we can migrate all the theorems and the results and bounds from fry LPP into this new setting. Okay, I guess this is a good time to take question before I jump into the next step. So any questions so far? I, I want to ask uh, in regards mm -hmm. the previous slide that we have seen, mm -hmm. what are we sampling the the challenge upon for like okay. is el uh -huh. and er what we are sampling the challenge in the challenge for okay. like you, what are we how do we sample you, you mean how do we sample this u in how do c c1 for example yeah. in this case c1 is the random challenge from is a field element from verify uh -huh. based on p l and pr i assume uh, no it's just a uh it's just a random random challenge from the verify it's field elements is similar to yeah but you i mean but if uh -huh. i has hashed something i assume no oh, oh you're saying you can do fear shamir yeah yeah exactly oh okay i see so when you do fear shamir what you do is that you have this uh pi or this oracle here right and you have a large oracle but in practice it definitely needs to commit it like for example using some merkle tree uh to commit it and the prover will send some merkle root for Merkle commitments to the verify, and we will do fear Shamir from these Merkle commitments and you generate C1. So basically uh, what we do is that verify will generate C1 from the commitment of pi here. 
Okay, fair enough. Okay. And uh, and uh, the prover will generate pi one, which also corresponds to another commitment, right? And verify after receiving this commitment, we will generate the next challenge C two in the next round. So this is how it uh, how how we do uh field charge tra field charge mutual transform is almost identical to in the fry setting. Yes, okay. Okay. Yeah. Fair Does enough. it answer your question? Yeah. 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 Completely. Completely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we come to uh, the second um, part, which is the randomized foldable linear codes. So I will construct a new randomized foldable linear codes that is field agnostic. And recall that by this property, this code is uniquely specified by the base code and these T vectors here. Well, in the resolving code, it just powers of roots of unities. And here now the question is that how can we set these TL vectors and TR vectors so that I support arbitrary field and still have good re relative distance. And our construction is embarrassingly simple. Basically, we just choose these TIL vectors and TIR vectors to be some independently random example field elements. But I note that the, we, we, we won't sample zero. We will sample all the units in this field uh, F here. And the TIR will be just the negative of TIL. And this certainly satisfies these constraints in, foldable, uh, in our foldable code. And the good thing here is that there's almost no re field restriction. We can choose arbitrary field. And the only, cons uh, only caveat or only constraint here is that you have to make sure that the field size is relatively large, which is related to the minimum distance bound we can get. So usually it's fine as long as it's larger than 1,000, you know, which is not a big deal. And finally, well, we have a trivial recursive encoding algorithm. That trans uh, that's doing do this encoding in cost linear time with really small cons constant. So in order to encode ML concat MR, what you do is you encode ML and MR recursively first, and then you do this vector addition and a head map product to get the encoding of ML concat MR. So it's very really really fast in our construction. So this is the idea. So you may ask why, why we care about it. Why, what's anything novel about this? The no, thing novel about this is that the, we need to analyze that it indeed has some really good minimal relative, relative distance, which is important for the PCS soundness bound we get. And to analyze its um, relative distance, it suffices to analyze the non-zero Hemingways of any non-zero code words, OK? because this is a folklore theorem in the coding theory because the difference of any code words is still code word by linearity. So the number of difference of two, uh, of two different code words will never be more than the uh, minimum of non-zero Hamming weight. So now it suffices to argue that for any non-zero message, the corresponding code words will have very few number of zeros on it. And to prove it, we'll reuse the property we had before about this uh, Foldability property. So the encoding of ML concat MR can be uh, represented as this form, right? Basically, we have two copies of encoding of ML and two copies of encoding of MR. And in the middle, this orange vector will be this uh, random TIL vectors and TRR vectors. So in order to analyze how many zeros in this blue uh, in this blue screen, we will consider three cases. The first case is that. So first, we know that there will be some zeros in the coding of ML and encoding of MR. And the first case is that for such a column, that both zero, uh, both green and both and uh, the black part are zero. So in this part, definitely we know that the corresponding blue entry is always zero because zero plus some um, a one a i times zero is still zero. And the second case is only one of them are zero. For example, here is zero x, here is y zero. In this case, we know that the blue entry will never be a zero. We will be always non-zero. And finally, we have the last case. Well, both, like for some, for some column, both the green entry and the gray entry are non-zero. Then in this case, we know that the blue entry will be zero only with probability over one over, one over f minus one, uh, where the random is chosen from these a vectors here. Right, because we, as we've seen here, these a vector are independently and randomly chosen. So that means the number of zeros in this blue shaded area will follow some Bernoulli transformation with parameter around one over f. So now this gives us a way to analyze how many zeros are here. 
So suppose by induction hypothesis, we already have some bond about the ice encoding scheme. And we know that for the ice encoding scheme or non-zero code words, we have at most L zeros on it. Then we know the number of red zeros will never be more than two L, right? So given that we know the, the probability that this blue encoding have two, more than two L plus delta zeros will be very, the probability will be very, very small so long with, as we said delta to be large enough. And we need this probability to be negligible. So at this point, we know we have a bound on this number of zeros for a certain fixed message, ML concat MR. However, what we want is a, a bound for arbitrary uh, non-zero code words, right? So that's why we also need to take a union bound over all possible messages. So this probability needs to be multiplied by a really large factor, which is really, really bad because that means we have to choose a really large delta in order to make it negligible. So given this, we want to have a more tighter bound. The observation here is that in the previous estimates, we have a really loose bound on, on the number of red zeros in the first case. Because for many cases, actually we know that encoding of ML and encoding of MR, they have significantly fewer number of zeros than L because L is just the worst case bound uh, in the ice encoding scheme. So therefore our idea is the following. So we want to have a more fine-grained estimate on the number of red zeros here. So for any message, we'll define a maximal set S as the set S, which is a subset of C times two to the I, uh, or the subset of the block, such that the encoding of ML as well as the encoding of MR on this subset S should all be zeros. And also this S should be maximal, okay? So this is exactly the uh, very, very precise um, description for the first case. So basically the number of red zeros in this case is exactly two times S, right? Therefore we can, uh, because we have um, the, the number of red zeros, the bound is two S rather than two L, we can have much sharp bound for the number of zeros in the encoding of ML concat MR, which is um, uh, described here. So basically we have a much, much smaller bound which is because of these red terms Q times L minus S here. So now we can have a union bound now. The idea is to do separate union bound for each category of S. So for every S, we will have some message that satisfy this maximal set requirements and we'll multiply this with the bound we had before. So this reduced the question to check how many code words are here such that they are all zero on subset S. And we want to have an upper bound on this, uh, on, on this. And the idea to prove it is uh, not very hard. So we have considered two cases. The first case is that the subset is, uh, has a size that's larger or equal than L. And by the induction hypothesis we had before, we already proved that all non-zero code words in the previous encoding scheme will never have more than L zeros, right? So that means that that's their on, the only code word that satisfy this is will be only zero code words. So there won't be more than one uh, code words in, inside this case. And the more interesting case is when this subset S is less, the size of it is less than L. And in this case, we can reduce to the first case. The idea is following. So given a message M, the map to the encoding of M on subset S is exactly some matrix map, right? Because we know uh, linear code can be understood as some matrix multiplication on the message. So this corresponds to some matrix map G here. And to argue how many messages are here that maps to all zeros, it basically reduced to check how many messages are here in the kernel of this matrix map. And to analyze this, we can consider a superset of S, say S prime, where S prime will con contains S and that the size of S prime is exactly L. And as we proved before, for all those cases uh, that has size larger or equal than L, the kernel of it will be zero, right? Only single elements will be there in the kernel. And also because G are just some, a subset of the columns of G prime, basically uh, is G is just the G prime deleted some L minus S uh, columns of it. So that means the kernel of G will have uh, like the rank of kernel of G will be less than or equal than L minus S. So it will be a, some vector space 
with rank of about um, L minus S. So the number of elements in this vector space by some rank longitude theorem can be bounded. So the number of messages here will be mo no more than F to the L minus S. So this, for this, we, get, we have an upper bound on the number of message that uh, has encoding to all zeros on subset S. And now we can do the union bound again, and it turns out the final bound is very, very good. And the final bound we get is almost the same as the bound we get in the previous naive analysis without the union bound. And this is the delta we get here. Okay, so this finishes the proof why it has a really good relative distance. So any questions so far? Yeah, I, I have a question on that. How do you <laughs> fix the parameters? Uh... The, the parameter C, yeah, how do you pick it? Or it, uh, does it come uh, like from, you mean, do you leave it from somewhere? Uh, parameter C, you mean? Yeah, C in S, yeah, exactly. Uh, C times C, I, I, yeah, so this C is just the uh, the rate of the of this uh, encoding, right? Oh, oh fair enough, yeah, 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 okay, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah. okay, okay. It's yeah. just the encoding scheme, you have a message space, you have a, uh, you have a, uh, you have a, a block space and you make, yeah, it's a good point that you have to make C large enough so that uh, uh, like you have enough space for, for errors. So you do, the C is kind of, uh, uh, how do you say is usually what, what we pick like in our, in our station C usually is just about eight or four, I think. It's more than, should be definitely more than four, uh, but I think eight is enough. Yeah. Okay, I see. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, finally, let me uh, go through the last step. So we have this space for IOPP. Let's see how we can uh, transform into marking in a PCS. So recall the notion of a polynomial commitment scheme. So in the polynomial commitment scheme, after generating parameters in the setup phase for some uh, polynomial size bound, the prover given some Martinian polynomial of d different variables. Um, it will be able to generate a short string committing to this polynomial. Here by Martinian polynomial, I mean the is a polynomial with multiple variables and the degree of each variable is less or equal than one. And as a commitment scheme, definitely have to satisfy the binding property and the hiding property. And I'll focus on binding here, which means that it is infeasible for the prover to generate two different valid uh, polynomials that commit to the same string CF. And later in the evaluation phase, as a polynomial commitment scheme, we should also be able to generate a proof for convincing the verifier that the, the CF is the commitment of some polynomial F such that F evaluated at some point Z equals Y. And to do this, the prover should be able to generate some proof, which is a proof of knowledge meaning that suppose the verifier accepts, they must be the case the prover knows uh, some witness polynomial that maps to this evaluation, that satisfies this evaluation statement. So in the Martinia setting, we do have several constructions for it that has a relatively fast prover, uh, which I also mentioned a, li a little bit before. So we have this Fry transformation one, where starting with some Fry LPP, we can transform using the quotient trick into a univer PCS, then we can transform into Martinian PCS using some other transformation. And examples include the Gemini, Hyperplonk, and Zero Morph. They all explain and describe some kind of transformation here. The advantage here is that it has a relatively fast verifier and a relatively uh, small proof size, which is usually hundreds of kilobytes. It's just not very, very small, but uh, it's still much smaller compared to Breakdown, which is uh, like um, several megabytes or tens of megabytes size. And the drawback, as we said before, is not field agnostic. It requires the use of FFT-friendly field. The second approach is this breakdown approach, which compiles some so-called tensor IOPP into Martin APCS. The advantage is it has a really fast prover and the field agnostic. However, and the verifier and the proof size is really, really uh, expensive. So our construction is a third option. Well, we can build based on any IOPPs for these foldable codes and then interleave it with a sum check, and then we can obtain a new Martini PCS. And because the sum check is super efficient, uh, the overhead is almost uh, negligible compared to the complexity of IOPP itself. So the advantages is the first, it can be made field agnostic if we use some field agnostic foldable codes. And the second, 
we don't have any expensive transformation step anymore. So it's uh, also a significant uh, prover improvement. And finally, compared to breakdown, we still preserve logarithmic verification and proof size. So the construction is actually uh, pretty simple. So suppose we are given a, a polynomial F, which is a multi-linear polynomial, and we order the coefficients of this multi-linear polynomial according to a vector. And the commitments of uh, F is basically the encoding of this F vector uh, and make it a, a, it's exactly the Merkle commitment of this encoding of F vector. So basically what we do is that we will build a Merkle tree and the leaves are exactly the foldable code for this uh, message uh, f vector here. And the Merkle roots will be our PCS commitments. And then in the evaluation proof space, in order to con convince the verifier that C is the Merkle commitment for some polynomial f, such that f evaluates at point z equals s, our idea is that we will transform this evaluation statement fz equals s into a sum check claim. So it's by this uh, fork law Martinino extension theorem, we can uh, represent the evaluation of Martinian polynomial at the point Z as the sum of, uh, as an interpolation of many of the, dis of all the evaluations on the Boolean hypercube. So basically you can rewrite FZ where Z is outside the Boolean hypercube to be the sum of F, uh, Fx times EZ, EQZx, where X is enumerated over the Boolean hypercube. And this EQZX polynomial is the disinterpolated polynomial. We can understand it as the Lagrange polynomial in the Martinini case. Okay, so now we have transformed this evaluation statement into a sum check claim. And we have the very efficient and famous protocol for proving sum check claims, right? So the goal is to convince that given some oracle F, we want to prove that sum of evaluation of F, of F uh, is exactly some claim value S. Naively, what you can do, you can let the verifier to query F on all the points in the Boolean hypercube, right? Um, but that's really, really inefficient because the verifier needs to query to do the entries of F. But this protocol is a protocol that allows you to only make one query, which is super efficient. The idea is following. In the, in the first round, the prover will send a univariate polynomial, HDX, which is the sum of two to the D minus one univariate polynomials, which is FBX here. And if this HDX is correctly computed and equals the right-hand side, then it reduced to the check of HD0 plus HD1 equals S, right? So this original sum check claim is equivalent to this, uh, two, this claim about the sum of HD0 plus HD1. And after that, the verify of this check, the verifier reduced to the check that the prover is indeed sending the correct polynomial, right? It might be possible that prover is sending some junk polynomial HDX that doesn't equals right-hand side. But by the schwarz zippel lemma, we know that if HDX doesn't equal to the right-hand side, then with overwhelming probability of some random challenge, the sum won't be equal. The evaluation sum, uh, evaluation, the, the evaluation on the left-hand side won't be equal to the evaluation on the right-hand side. So now it reduced the original task into a new task to check that this new sum check claim holds true, which has dimension D minus one rather than D. So we can do this again and again and again, and finally reduce to one small uh, sum check, which has dimension zero, which is basically just checking this single value equals H1 R1. And this single value can be made, can be queried by a verifier um, using single query to F. So this is the idea of sum check. And after having this background, we can go back to our goal of doing evaluation proof. So you see here that this, actually there's a tiny, tiny but also subtle difference on the task in our case. So basically for now, even though some check uh, works, but finally it still needs to make one query to this committed Oracle F, right? So finally, when you want to check F equals H1 R1, how do you make sure the F value is exactly what we want? So basically it seems that at first glance, we are just transforming a arbitrary evaluation query to a random evaluation query to the PCS on the random points R1 to Rd. So it doesn't seem to give any, uh, any advantages here, right? So we still need to rerun this PCS proof. But the key point here is that this R1 to Rd are some random challenges 
that we can exploit, we can use. So our idea is to use these random challenges as the random challenge in the IOPP as well. So record IOPP after receiving some challenge RD will do this folding. And we can order the vector of F in a way so that the left hand side, the message left hand side FL are the, co are the coefficients of those monomials in the multi multi polynomial that has no term about XD. And the right hand side are those monomials that has term about XD. So the folding will be exactly FL plus RDFR. And if you look more closely, it will be exactly the coefficients of this partial polynomial fx1, xd minus 1, and rd. And this is exactly the polynomial used in this new reduced sum check lamp. So that means we, we similarly have a transformation and reduction as before, where initially we have some uh, evaluation claim about some d dimension d polynomials. Now we transform to a um, like evaluation claim about dimension d minus 1 polynomials. So we can do this again and again. And finally, we'll come to the last case where we want to check that uh, the evaluation claim about a zero dimension polynomial, which is that I want to check that H1R1 equals some F0 times E2ZR. Well, F0, well, I want to check this F0 is consistent with the oracle in pi zero. And this is very, very easy to check Either the verifier can decode this oracle pi zero, or the prover can send the message underlying this uh, encoding, and the verifier check that the encoding is consistent with pi zero. And that's fi finish our proof. And also, as we have mentioned before, the prover might need to uh, might send some junk polynomial in the middle. So that's why we also need to do this consistency check, which is already covered by the IOPP verification case. Right? So we will do this consistent check in IOP verif verification phase and use to detect any malicious behavior. And if malicious behavior doesn't uh, happen, then we know that, okay, this is exactly the value we want. So the intuitively, this is a very, very simple construction, but it turns out that uh, the proof for noise soundness and the evaluation binding are like, much more non-trivial to prove. Uh, for time reason, I guess if if the audience has has interest, we can talk more about how to prove it. But I think I'll skip this here because it's not that uh, important. But if the audience has any interest, uh, I will I can go through later. Okay, so that's the idea of the uh, Martinian PCS construction, and which is super super efficient. Basically, just uh, you just have an IOPP and interleave with an ultra efficient sum check and you are done. So this is uh, our main uh, contribution. In summary, we have made three main contribution. First, we have generalized the FRI LPP that it can now work for any so-called foldable linear code for which the re code is just a special case. And second, we construct a new foldable linear code that has fast encoding and is also field agnostic. Finally, we have a efficient compila compilation from baseful LPP or generalize IOPP for foldable code into Martinini PCS by interleaving it with a sum check. And the complexity of this Martinini PCS is almost identical to the complexity of IOPP. Okay, so that's it. And uh, there are also several interesting open questions. So first is that you see that our, our foldable code is still causing linear, has still has a causing linear or an O log n, n log n prover time. So it's an interesting question whether we can have a linear time encodable for the code. And the impact of it is actually really, really significant because the only places in our PCS that has a cost in linear complexity is exactly the encoding of foldable code. Suppose we have a linear time encodable code, then that implies that the PCS we have is also linear time, which is a great breakthrough because now that implies that SNARK itself is linear time. So it's, this is a really, really uh, challenging, but also very, very useful and interesting open questions. The second open question is that whether we can have a foldable code that has the maximum possible relative distance, but also is field agnostic. So first, for the re code, we do have this maximal relative distance um, property, but it's not field agnostic. 
while our random code construction, even though it has good minimal distance, it is still not far from optimal, but it's field agnostic. So it's an open question whether we can achieve both, achieve the best of both worlds. And finally, uh, we can generalize this. Uh, the, finally, the question is whether we can generalize this IOPP to a broader class of codes, like, for example, unify the framework of the, all, all those related work. And also, uh, there's some new work called Binius, which uh, uh, allows you to commit some polynomial that has super smooth, smooth coefficients, like, like field of size two. And it will be a great open question to check whether it can be this trick can be combined with that trick to uh, have commitment scheme that is super efficient for those polynomial that has really small coefficients. And finally, is that whether we can have a better PCI soundness proof. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, and now I'm happy to take uh, even more questions. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much, Bingy, for your for your time and for the explanation. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is related to, uh, if I understood correctly, you are using the elements that you get within the intermediate rounds of the sum check protocol, like all of these uh, challenges, let's say, and you're reusing those for the split of the polynomial uh, that you explained at the beginning of the presentation, the one that has the, oh, the so open are, event coefficients? It's mostly for folding. Uh, let me see. So it's fry here. So you are saying here, Yeah, here. Right? yeah exactly. So here C1 is used to fold these two FE polynomial and the FO polynomial here. Yeah. So C1 is a scalar. Uh, so that's after folding, because FEX and FOX all both have a lower degree, and after folding, you have a uh, you also have a lower degree polynomial. Sure. Uh, can you uh, can you elaborate on your questions? Again? Yeah. So did I assume correctly that the C one that I see here, uh, mm -hmm. it's basically coming from the sum check that you have previously performed, and you are oh you are saying in the Martinian construction exactly. Yeah. Are you like oh, reusing these things such yeah, that yeah. you okay 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 exactly okay. exactly and this exactly. Is... Is this what then complicates more the 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 knowledge soundness and the security proof? Okay, I guess it will be nice if I can explain to you why this complicated. Uh, yeah, so this is a great, really great question, and that's one of the reason why it complicates it because I re you are reusing this challenge here, right? And yeah. uh, and as we see before, that so to argue this the binding property. Meaning that uh, if the, if the protocol passes, then there exists some unique polynomial f such that some check claim holds. Um, so, so I want to argue that this some check claim holds. Basically, the sum of f equals z x is uh, is equal to s, and that is uh, implied by the final uh, evaluation claim about f. Right. Basically, I want yeah. to know that f z f zero r is exactly the value I want to get from f. Right. Yeah, that's correct. So, so basically, I want to make sure that the, for the last oracle, pi zero, it, pi zero is exactly the encoding of fr. Okay. Oh, uh, I so, see. Okay. And this is not guaranteed uh, by IOPP, even if you are reusing this random challenge, because IOPP only tells us that every oracle is close to code words. It not, it's not going to give us a guarantee that it's always close to the same code words. Right. Yeah. 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 So the the quick question is why why do we know the last oracle sent by the prover in the last round is exactly consistent with the first oracle, the original oracles sent by the by, by the prover, which is the commitment of polynomial. Right. So we have to yeah. prove this, and in order to prove this, the idea is that in each intermediate rounds, the oracle sent by the prover should always be close to code words, which is a property by the IOPP, and Suppose for contradiction that the prover switch from a one polynomial to a different polynomial at the end, then we can reach some contradiction uh, using this consistency check because that means there exists some round before this round, the prover is, is sending some oracle that close to the polynomial f, to the partial polynomial of f, and after this round is sending some polynomial close to some other different polynomial g. But we can argue that the oracle will be close to both code words. And this reaches some contradiction, 
uh, so that uh, so that we can argue that uh, we can guarantee that uh, that this last oracle is exactly the same is exactly the encoding of fr where r is the using is is the oracle is the random challenge exactly used in the in the sum check so okay. if you if you do this sequentially then the analysis will be very very simple but when you do this sequentially you go back to a circle right and mm -hmm. as you said before here is because we really reuse this random challenge in both ILPP and sum check and this makes this uh, analysis more involved as you said Whoa. Uh, because we need to argue that finally the, the last oracle is exactly consistent with the evaluation of F on this random challenge R, which is not that easy to prove. And is that is that worth it in the sense of what are you saving up at the end? You are saving up hashing, I assume, right? You're assuming duplicating hashing or doing twice as many hashing as you were doing. Uh, I'm saving, I'm actually not, it's not a problem, it's not a problem about saving, it's a problem of feasibility. So you, if you do this sequentially, okay, let's say you do this sequentially, you don't, you don't do it uh, um, like in parallel. Then after running this sum check, you reduce to a new PCS evaluation, uh, for, uh, evaluation query uh, problem, right? And then you need to generate a new PCS uh, evaluation proof. I and then you see. go back to a circle. You can never do this sequentially. Yeah. Because you can go, after going this circle, you, you transform to a random evaluation query and you run this again, some check again, you run, you come to another PCS evaluation query. You will never go into an end. You can, that means you can never generate a PCS evaluation proof. So it's basically, if you don't do this interleaving, you basically cannot have a PCS evaluation proof. So it's, yeah. it's not well, only about the efficiency, it's about the feasibility. You, you can only cool. achieve it, you can only achieve it only when you do this interleaving. Wow. Okay. That's really curious. Okay. Okay. And the, the other question that I had is, um, is there any way to, although you want to be field agnostic, choose the T parameters on a smarter way that it's not just negating one, uh, negating the previous one such mm -hmm. that you get better, uh, distance, uh, properties. I mean, I don't know if that influences or not. It might not have anything to do with it. But can you, like, is it just okay to negate uh, TIL to get TIR? Or can you do it, like, on a much smarter way uh, such that you get better properties for the entire scheme? Yeah, it's totally possible. It's just uh, uh, we didn't find any, like, uh, like, any approach that can improve like improve, improve it further. And this is the most natural way we have to think because randomness is a, is a really a great power to, powerful tool. And uh, as you said, it might be there's some really structured way to build the TIR rather right, than just to neg negate that allows us to have a really better bond. Um, that's a good point, but I, I haven't thought really deeply about this yet. And uh, yeah, I, maybe, yeah, maybe there's some way, but uh, I haven't figured out like if you do this, what would be the corresponding analysis of minimal distance? But that's a really interesting question. Mm, and definitely I think it's possible, but I have it's just, just I haven't thought really, really deeply about it yet. Yeah. Okay. That's fair because you are, I mean, you can only come with the properties of a field, I assume, right? If you want to be agnostic. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a very limited amount of operations that you can do and mm -hmm. very limited amount of assumptions that you have. So okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are there any are there any other questions? Uh, I don't see anything in the chat. I have a, okay. I have a question. Um, so like uh, regarding the quasi linear ver verification time. So uh, uh, verification now, time is not quasi linear. Uh, it's prover time. The proof size. The the pr okay. I guess my question is so generally, uh, how people resolve like the size of. I of of fry is that they do recursion, right? Uh, so that we compress that into like a constant size proof. Mm -hmm. And um, now that you compile fry into multilinear PCS, uh, do you have any comments on recursion? Like, do we mm -hmm. still have the same tool toolbox to solve this quasi linear issue so that we can put put the proof on chain? Uh, so first, uh, I want to clarify this uh, quasi linear. I, I think what you mean is the logarithmic. Right. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. And not cos and linear. It's logarithmic. Okay. Uh, yeah, logarithmic. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah. Uh, and second, yeah, I I think the 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 this recursion trick will still be able to use in our setting. Uh, basically, you can still do this recursion of this logarithmic size proof uh, in base fold and do do the recursion to make it constant size. It still works. And why we or why we don't consider about recursion here is that we want to make a fail comparison, right? Because everything can do recursion, but the, mm -hmm. the, the key key here is that we don't want to do recursion now because recursion really adds a lot of overhead uh, on the prover side as well, and uh, this overhead is dependent on the size of the proof as well, right? So basically, for example, if you do recursion on uh, fry, uh, it's much, much cheaper than do recursion on breakdown, right? Because breakdown mm -hmm. has a really, really large proof size and the uh, verification cost is also larger. So the corresponding recursion overhead is also larger. So here the key, key question is whether we can have a scheme that before recursion is already very efficient and also has a really relatively small uh, verification cost. And that means when you really want to do recursion, the overhead can be relatively small. So that's, that's the principle and philosophy here. So in summary, first, our, our trick and our construction has a similar, can be extended similarly as, as we do it for Fry PCS, that we can do recursion. And the mm -hmm. second, that we don't consider recursion is because we don't want to add overhead on the prover time. So in some in some applications, well, the proof size and the verification is fine uh, for some hundreds of kilobytes of proof size. Then definitely the best way is not to do recursion, right? Because we want to optimize the prover time. But if you you cannot afford to have a 100 kilobytes proof, then you are right. Maybe we should do recursion. And the reason that we can still preserve a logarithmic verification cost is something helping you to do recursion. Uh, compared to mm -hmm. to those scheme that has a really really large proof size, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. So That's it's a is an improvement on recursion, um, comparing to at least Lajaro and breakdown. Yes. So if you want to do recursion, then definitely it's better than I think that definitely better than than breakdown, and uh, the recursion overhead is similar to Fry I think, and compared to mm -hmm. Fry is field agnostic, right? Which mm -hmm, is another mm -hmm. great saving. Okay, makes sense. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, so are there any other questions? Okay, I will assume not. So, Bingy, thank you very much for, for coming and explaining uh, yeah, thank that you for well, the this entire protocol. Uh, I will upload the recording as, as soon as I can. And yeah, as always, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, it was it was really nice being here. So once again, thank yeah. you so much. And thank you so and much. Have a nice day. Yeah, Cheers. you too. Have a nice day.